What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Datadash and today is April 17th of 2024. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video we've got to spend some time to talk about how global markets are sending some big warning signs. I don't mean to be melodramatic here, but I think whether you're looking at Bitcoin, whether you're looking at the altcoin market, or if you're looking at the macro charts here, there are some serious signs that we could be due for a healthy market correction. I'm not even saying a full-on recessionary bear market or anything like that, but we need to be prepared here for further downside. And I think it could go lower than many people expect here. I want to talk about why that is. We've got a lot to dive into in today's video, so if you happen to enjoy, consider dropping a like. It's a great way to support the channel, and stay tuned as we're going to be having a review of Rocket X Exchange later on. A really exciting DEX play in the crypto space that I'm keeping on my radar. So let's go ahead and just dive straight into things, guys. We got to talk a little bit here about Bitcoin and all coins. I think that there is a substantial amount of evidence here within price that something is going wrong, that essentially all of the things that we're carrying forward price here, the anticipation to the halving event, the ETF inflows, which were really remaining strong back in February and March, or excuse me, February for the most part, but it started to fade in the later parts of March and April. We are now starting to see manifest within price. Essentially, back here, we were holding resilient, started to charter higher here to new all-time highs at around $73,600. But since then, we not only have not been able to clear through that prior new all-time high, but every time we come down to this range here at the low $60,000 range, roughly around $62,000, testing that prior range back in late February, the bounces have gotten weaker and weaker. You can see here we had a resilient bounce of near 9 to 10% on the first retest of that range. But after that, we also had a bounce here, fading at the same resistance range back here in late March, but a slower and steadier bounce here, and then followed by not only sell side pressure back to that range, but an inability for buyers to come in and get back above the 21 day moving average. This is the market's way of signaling that sell side pressure or market sell side pressure. Or there's market buy orders and sellers. There's always going to be a buyer and a seller on each side of the trade. There's no doubt about that. But market sell side pressure from market order flow is outpacing buy side pressure from market order flow. What this basically means is that sellers are more willing to take the best available price on the order book and therefore lead the trend direction price. And that's not a good sign here. It means lower prices. It means that there's people who are looking to offload positions who feel like the trend is potentially stalling here. Right? And as much as at the end of the day, I understand we came to the prior all-time highs here, we may have very well the opportunity for Bitcoin to charge on to a, another bull market and go to six figures and live in la-la land and be all happy and excited and all coins have an all coin cycle. That could all still happen, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to face a heavy correction shaking out some people and those who are over leveraged on that bet of buying at the all-time highs. And that's where the dilemma is here, guys, is that irrespective of what happens on the macro, Already, we need to be ready to accept that there could very well be a correction at this range. We've already reviewed, looking back at previous retests of prior cycle highs. So in 2017, when we got back to the 2013 high before the Mt. Gox collapse, or when we, for example, came back up to the 2017 highs of the prior bull market. In some cases, we clear through, we do relatively well, but in some cases, you can face double-digit substantial corrections. And when you consider the fact that if we just take a look at the price range here from the new all-time highs to where we are now, we are only down about 15%. That's relatively moderate. And considering how much Bitcoin has expanded over the past year, really in a real year worth of price action, I think that we need to consider that that is very well a potential reality of what could happen here over the next couple of weeks. And we need to be prepared for that. I think that there's a good chance once we snap through here to start looking for the ranges that would be typical by the dip ranges, like the 100 day moving average, which isn't too far from where we're at right now. But I think that this is going to mean not only obviously Bitcoin goes through a continued correction, a solid single digit or potentially light double digit uh, correction from this point around. So we're around like, you know, maybe 10%, 15%. But beyond that as well, there's also the ability for price to come down towards a more substantial moving average like the 200 day, which is aligning quite nicely here with the previous resistance range or part where price essentially started to top after the launch of the ETFs. So something like that could play out here. But again, 
I'm not saying you need to wait around for all that. I'm just saying the more and more this gets down towards these moving averages, that's where you can feel more comfortable entering into a substantial position. The reason I talk a lot about Bitcoin, as you guys know, is I'm really focused on altcoins. And for me personally, I really think we haven't seen our move in altcoins yet if we are going to have a continuation of the cycle. So for me, it's one of those things where you don't have to risk so much capital. Um, and the great thing about it is that it's essentially a high risk, high reward play where I can put a little bit of capital, not too much, uh, into some bets here when we get into a valuable range uh, that shows long term support. And from there, I can have a really good asymmetric bet essentially where if things do work my way, I can make some great returns but I'm not risking all my capital. I'm preserving and protecting the vast majority of my capital over the long term. I wanted to bring your attention here. I'll bring it here to the two weeks, so it's just a little bit. Uh, we can kind of zoom in a bit more. There's a very significant trend line here. What we've got here is others market cap divided by BTC USD. This is taking all of the altcoins in the market, excluding the top 10 cryptocurrencies. So why this is very valuable here is this really gives us a picture of the broader altcoin market as a whole. And what I think here is that by taking others and dividing by Bitcoin, we get a custom ratio here of the performance of these, these assets. And we can see very clearly that there are certain particular times where it is very favorable to be in all coins. And there are times where, for the most part, Bitcoin is generally outpacing all coins. So if you aren't leaning into these cycles and these metrics, then you're going to get caught on the sidelines uh, or you're going to be left buying into a lot of bags that are really underperforming against Bitcoin. You want to know when it's time to really get in these plays. And one thing that I think is very important to consider here is that we're right near that kind of pocket of, of interest. This has been since April of 2017. So we're talking about years upon years here of price action, right? I would say if I'm not have my mouth wrong in this case, seven years of price action where essentially this has been the range or the pocket where you can buy altcoins and it gives you those kind of great returns here that eventually either you're going to have more of the moderate kind of moves like I think we've had since June of 2023 to December of 2023 or here in August 2019 to July of 2020. Really still not bad if you can get it, but also those periods of time like January 2021 or here in April of 2017, right? When I was getting into crypto at that time, you know, kind of in the earlier mid part of 2017, really starting to get invested into the altcoin space and really chase some of those new exciting plays. Right. The key thing here is this, is that I think there's a good chance you really get in that pocket. In fact, we've got the 100 month moving average here, another major significant moving average where if, if we get prices down there, I'm just going to start building some buy the dip plays. I'm going to buy into capitulation. We're going to see how it goes from that point on. And I think that's when you start getting some of the altcoin pairs down at some of the moving averages. Um, but again, just taking a look here at others market cap on its own. You can see clearly an inability to set new highs, lower highs here for the past couple of months. So, excuse me, the past, uh, really past month here from March 13th here to around April 10th. Chopping at the 200, or sorry, the 21 day moving average and a breakthrough, a clear breakthrough, 12% downward move followed by another 10% move. And the thing is here is that while the other day we made some great trades on the rebound out of the 200 day pocket, I felt like there was a great kind of risk reward setup there for a short term trade. We took profits relatively quick. We made some great returns. And I think we did that for a right reason here because for me, I care about seeing more importantly, and this is where I'd be able to put more capital in and hold it more long term, how price is going to react at that 100 day pocket. And so far here, guys, since our last video, I mean, it's clear in the charts. We are not asking a question of whether or not we're going to get through the 21 day moving average. We're asking a question whether or not this can get through the 100 day. And it doesn't look like it right now. That is really bad because we've already gone through, you know, if we consider here from relative highs, we saw a 40% correction. Now at valuations, it's down 30%. That's typical by the dip price ranges here for a more conservative correction in all coins. I know 30% already sounds like a lot to most people, but I mean, in, in all coins, you guys know, you know, you can have these kind of corrections and then, you know, these are just, you know, these happen every couple of months after great rallies and great moves like we've had. But this really puts us back not too far from where we were back here in like December. And it's a couple tens of billions more in market cap for other market cap. But it looks like we're heading straight back down there. And that will put us back towards essentially eliminating four, potentially up, coming up on five months of price action. So my main point here is that I think that there's a chance that you easily come down to that 200 pocket. But don't be surprised if we come down to longer term moving averages like the 200 week which really have not been tested yet. 
to become support for a broader long-term move as we kind of zoom out here. All right, there is that chance where we come down here, make that support, make the prior resistance back here in August 2020, uh, prior support back in July 2021 at 150 billion. We make that support. And the reason I'm gonna tell you guys this, like, and I say this with a degree of confidence, I'm not saying it absolutely has to go there, but the reason why something like that could very well happen is I think whether or not people you know, who are bullish on the market would like to tell you or not, I think we all have a pretty good hunch that this drive or move in altcoins is not one of fundamentals. It's not one of you know there being transformative new innovations in the altcoin sector. If meme coins are probably our biggest narrative, I think that pretty is pretty damning and telling of just the state of innovation in the crypto space, um, and real use cases and narratives. But the other thing I would say as well that you should keep in mind, and some people won't tell you this, but I will, and that is that the order books in this market are incredibly thin. They're incredibly thin, guys. And you need to keep that dynamic in mind here in the sense that while thin order books can allow for price to accelerate a very little volume, uh, as we've seen here, and very little activity. I mean, consider the kind of activity, the trading activity, the liquidity input into the crypto space that was happening back here in 2021, right? And just like how dips, even the significant dips, like the 50% were just bought up, driving prices right back up again, versus what's going on now. Altcoins are only moving up here off of the hopes of the Bitcoin ETF and the halving of it carrying Bitcoin forward and saving markets, right? So you can see just how markets can rise really quick in the, these weekly candles here and the, the two weeks uh, here in the later part of February, here in the part of early April. Markets can come up really quick and markets can come down just as fast. So I'm only telling you that here not to be a perma bear. We, we made great money over the past couple months on altcoins. But we've been in cash and avoided a lot of this downward move where a lot of people have unfortunately just been sold in the narrative that you just hodl, 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 just hold through. And at the end of the day, you can really get cooked and lose a lot of returns. If we were still holding the plays we were trading here, I mean, we would be burnt badly. Like on some of the meme coins out there, um, some of the narratives that we're watching, even the solid ones, you know, are, are down, you know, from when we were kind of trading at that range. Uh, you know, 40, 50, 60%. So you have to know how to get in, how to get on these plays, lock in profits, and don't always just rotate back to Bitcoin if Bitcoin is not showing the signs of strength, if it's not maintaining the 21 day, if it's not showing you that it's going to continue making money. Now, I want to come back. I want to talk about some altcoin trades later on in the video uh, for ones that we're going to be watching. But I want to spend some time here to talk a little bit about the macro because I think this is imperative for you guys to be considering here. I know a lot of people out there because they're not trading equities or they're mainly focused on trading in the crypto space. We don't take the time all the time to always want to study the macro markets. And I can get that. Uh, I used to be that way and stuff where I just wanted to focus on the stock price itself. And to be fair, like overall, if, if that's the asset you want to trade, that's fine. You can just like focus on the charts. But the problem I'd say is that you're going to miss the hints that the market is giving you across the board that potentially a major correction could be coming that may be completely separate from the asset itself and could lead to substantial volatility that you may not expect. So just keep that in mind. Uh, why we focus on the macro here is, is to get hints of broader trends and to really be able to find also opportunities in the market. Take a look here at the chart that I know I've, I've been in like a dead horse, guys. I know I probably drive some of you guys nuts bringing this up here. The, U, the U.S. 10-year yield minus the U.S. 2-year yield. Uh, these are treasury yields. This is what's known as generally the yield curve. Now, the important thing here about this chart that measures the separation between the 10-year yield and 2-year yield is that we're in negative territory, right? This essentially means that a, a longer-term treasury note of 10 years, 10 years of maturity, government debt, is paying you a lower yield than the 2-year yield, which, again, it's as if you're in the twilight zone. It doesn't really make much fundamental sense because the idea is if you're locking up capital or giving the government essentially uh, capital in, in return for an IOU with some kind of yield, you would essentially expect that if you're having your capital matured over a longer period of time, you should be earning more. Well, this happens throughout history. We have yield curve inversions. We had one in, in February 2007. We had it here in July 2000. And we had it here back in 1989. There are much more. Unfortunately, TradingView doesn't have all the pricing data here. But the key thing is that the yield curve inversion in this case, or essentially when we go into negative territory, is one of the biggest precursors to an eventual, like, inevitable recession to some extent. It has been the most consistent, one of the most consistent metrics we have at our disposal. And while I've been saying here not to panic, 
that we're in this range because some of the greatest euphoria and ridiculousness in markets can happen during these windows of time where people are still taking risk in assets like altcoins, like technology stocks. I see people buying up the FANG stocks here, which are not really growing substantially, but now they're still trading at growth multiples of 30, 40, or 50. And their price to earnings multiple, which is just ridiculous. I mean, I understand markets aren't always on fundamentals, but we're, we are living in la-la land with current valuations. We'll just put it that way. And I'll explain that as we go through the charts. The key thing here, though, with the yield curve inversion is that we've been wedging here since back in 2000, uh, 20, uh, 2023, back here essentially during October. And the important thing to just keep in mind here, guys, is watch how this is starting to cusp up here because when this is going to break out, if we look back at history, I want you guys to see that this will creep up on you very quickly. You will have substantial moves in these move, um, these uh, this yield curve and inversion, and we'll catch a lot of people off guard here. You can see back in 2000, right? We're ranging down here, not making any significant moves, and then you see a huge pop up here in January, and quickly and swiftly an adjustment in that yield curve, uninverting getting back to normalization in the bond or treasury market and you're going to inevitably from that point likely be seeing a recessionary pressure on not just the economy but also on equities i think this is your technical formation here i don't think a lot of people are really watching it i think because it's been sitting sideways for a while people are just back again to doing their old ways back in 2021 and speculating on financial instruments for those who are participating in markets take a look here at the vix as well right it's not just the yield curve. Uh, the VIX here has been really sitting in low volatility uh, since back in 2023. It has been in criminally low levels for the uh, for the greater part here of the last year. And we can see that slowly but steadily, it's not making any huge moves yet, but it's creeping back up and knocking on the door of the 200 week. Now we have not gotten a break above the 200 week since back here in March of 2023, since well over uh, a year now. All right. So the key thing here I want you guys to keep in mind is to watch for that break in the 200 week. And again, this doesn't mean I, I, I just want to make this very clear here, guys, because again, I understand when we talk about market direction, people either assume either you think markets are going to be raging higher with AI and crypto and the ETF or Bitcoin. It's just going to be great. Uh, and we're just going to go two, three X and all valuation across assets or more. And other people believe that when you're talking down about the market that means we're going to go into a recessionary bear market valuations are going to flash crash and it's just going to throw everyone off and we're going to have what we had back in covid or we're going to have a great depression like the 1920s or 2008 crash i'm not here to say that i'm here to say that we're, we're well overdue for a healthy correction in the case of equities this means a you know at a minimum 15 20 percent correction i would say uh, is, is probably your target range to look for, historically speaking. From my trading history, from what I've seen over the years, when I analyze back in the historical charts, that's what you kind of get, right? And outside of that as well, uh, and for Bitcoin, uh, you could see a 30% plus correction, you know, 40%, uh, in some cases, maybe a bit more moderate. But I mean, so far, we're already down 15%, as we talked about, getting into some of those moving average pockets, right? That's 22.5% of the 100-day. That's 35% here at the 200 day, taking us right down again back to that uh, prior resistance point at the ETF launch. Those are the kind of levels here that would be incredible levels uh, to start looking for some great risk reward setups. You're entering at a much more favorable price. You can start to see how price reacts at those moving averages. And from there, you can determine whether or not it feels comfortable for you to make a trade, right? So we, we are far away from really that corrective point that would give me that opportunity to, to really say, hmm, you know, I could really build some long positions here, right? Historically speaking, since back in 2020, this is a very frequently tested range at 33 points on the VIX. Historically, this is also just a significant range if you zoom out here. So we don't need a spike up here above the 70 point range like 2008 or here during the crash during COVID in March 2020. But I think that there's a good chance here you're coming up here to, to double the VIX here, or nearly double from where we are now, around the 30, the low 30 point range, around 33 points. I, I, just looking at the charts here, we are well overdue for that. We are well overdue, guys. And if this gets above 22 points like we had back here, I would beg to say that you've got a very good chance that this is going to be a long term deviation on the VIX and it's going to really whipsaw higher here up to 33 and maybe go a little bit higher, maybe up here towards 39, 40 points. I don't know what the catalyst will be. It could be other regional banks starting to collapse. It could be that the markets are really 
pricing in more Fed interest rate hikes or much less cuts than expected, which were kind of softening the performance of equities. But we'll have to see. The key thing here is that there's a couple other ways we can analyze this. We can take a look at a custom ratio that I track here in my trading. This is something, again, we share within the Dash report. If you guys want to get access to really cool metrics like this, we cover it within the newsletter and other kind of uh, areas within the dashboard community. Definitely check it out. The link down below in the description. Great way to support the channel. Uh, you guys can get 20% off if you sign up on an annualized basis. But the key thing here I want to share with you guys today is a really interesting chart that I've shared with dashboard members in the past. And this is the S&P 500 divided by the VIX, or SPX divided by VIX. And what we can see here is that back during the last couple of you know bull markets in the past, we have, generally speaking, this expansion of the NASDAQ or the SP 500, you know, equities are generally still trending up to the right. But when we divide it by volatility, we get these kind of extreme externalities of markets uh, or these, these extreme scenarios where essentially you can see when markets are probably well overdue for correction, they're getting overbought. And also when you get real capitulation events, because the VIX moves inversely to equity. So by dividing it, we get this really interesting chart where we see these scenarios where volatility is heightened. Uh, it gives us uh, periods of time where probably equities are way oversold and we get back into a, a kind of cheap fundamental value for equities where it could be some great entries. And what we tend to find here is that there's been since back in 1993, a consistent line of resistance here for the broader equity market, the SP 500 divided by the VIX. And when we test up into this range, just like we did here or back here in 2017, right? This is a period of time where equities against the VIX stop expanding. Uh, we can see here in 2007, right? This was the beginning before the 2008 crash. Back here in 2000, this is exactly when we started to see the collapse of the dot-com bubble and equities, broadly speaking, correcting. And here now, this is the first time we've tapped this since back in 2017, right? So we're we are even higher here in a disparity since where we were back in January 2020 before the COVID collapse. Um, here back in November 2021. AI has really driven valuations, you know, against volatility in this case and the ratio to crazy levels. And this isn't just the case here in the S&P 500, right? And we can see very clearly a trend here where you have these kind of uh, multi-year retests of a range. You get a deviation above it, a short-term window time where we break above it. People think it's a new paradigm and then we collapse, right? And that's exactly, I think, what's been kind of playing out here with AI here throughout 2024. Take a look here at the NASDAQ. Well, the chart is, is not as consistent here. Uh, it had more kind of extensive volatility back here uh, throughout this window of time, back in the early 2000s and the late 90s. We can see again, still trending up into the right. However, here in December 2017, before we had a, a kind of a bear market, it wasn't a bear market, I would say you had a, a kind of typical 15, 20% correction as we're talking about, spooked a lot of people, thought a recession was coming in. Um, again, nice corrective move below the 100 month. Uh, here in January 2020, same thing here. Uh, here in December 2021, where the COVID stimulus started to wear off, uh, the easy money was kind of over and equities corrected. Again, topping out here, coming down here below the 100 month. If we use those two points as a point of alignment here for a line of resistance, we've already tapped that here and we are already starting that correction process substantially. So my point here is that when you look at these charts here, what it signals to me is it signals that historically speaking, we are overbought and we have very well a good chance to either come down to a more moderate level like the 200 week pocket or ideally, and I think more realistically here, you get a chance to come below the 100 month EMA. And that's typically where you find those buy the dip opportunities. It'd be like buying back in 2022. It'd be like buying here in March, 2020 during the pandemic crash, November, December, 2018 or 2017, or excuse me, February, 2018, where you had these really nice Temporary dips in markets, nothing too crazy, uh, but I think that that's where we're heading here. And it still gives us the foundation. What I want to echo here is that just because I'm saying these things are going down, guys, as I echoed before, this could very well just mean that we have a healthy moderate correction, accumulators can buy, and we can continue on the same, you know, very well as the same trends and narratives that have already been working well here for the past couple of months. And maybe that we do get a bear market correction, we do get a sustained like 30, 40% drawdown in equities. I'm not here to make that kind of call. I don't see the catalyst for that, uh, you know, as much as we might have higher interest rates. I don't think that that would drag down equities that much. But my main point here is that I think equities are gonna underperform. I think that there's value elsewhere. 
I think that we need to find narratives that are beyond the FANG stocks, buying and DCAing just into Bitcoin off of hopes that institutions are going to buy our bags. I don't see that being enough to really carry us forward here. And we need to look for value elsewhere and keep more cautious about preserving and protect our capital, especially when you can right now buy U.S. Treasuries and get a substantial yield here. U.S. 10-year yield coming back up to 4.6%, huge rebound. And as we talked about, there's a good chance that unfortunately because the Fed did not tighten aggressively enough that it will have to play catch up and yields could come back to some of the levels we haven't tested since back here in the 90s. So keep that in mind. Um, when I take a look at XLF, financial sector signaling warning signs here, topping out at the same near same range it was at back in January 2022. We can see uh, oil as well trending strongly on the 21 day moving average one of the few assets that's really doing this here commodities are really taking the center stage here this looks very much like oil is flagging here after a great move over the past couple of months throughout the beginning of 2024 it looks like it's ready to bounce off higher test that resistance range back from here in october 2022 and september 2023 we take a look at the dollar the dixie right dollar currency index back up where it was back in october 2023 Take it to the weekly, just kind of get some more detailed price action. I mean, just really strong confidence here climbing up. A significant chart that you guys should keep on your radar is the US dollar to the Japanese yen. I know a lot of people are talking about the carry forward trade, but the key thing here I just want you guys to keep in mind is that the Japanese yen holds significant weight on the world stage. It's one of the major. Uh, I would even say it's one of the world world reserve currencies uh, overall. You know, Japanese economy. While it is definitely not growing substantially, it is a massive weight of global markets. And similar to the dollar, it's a significant currency. And it's important to understand that when the US dollar is continuing to garner significant strength, and is in fact this past month has cleared, excuse me, over the past quarter, has cleared through the line of resistance to its highest level in over 34 years. 34 years. This tells us that we're entering in some really wild territory because um, maybe outside of the price tag we had here in 1990, next point of resistance, according to history here for the US dollar to the Japanese yen, is 177 yen per dollar. This is going to have massive ramifications for the dollar and its strength. It is going to suppress in many ways, I think, asset prices to a large extent. These kind of things, alongside some macro tailwinds, global uncertainties, interest rate cut expectations being reduced uh, that would have priorly stimulated markets, that kind of stuff can give you your 15, 20% correction. It's the perfect storm for a nice healthy pullback. It won't be the end of the world, but it's sure as hell going to give us some opportunities to buy. Take a look here at precious metals as well. Now, I usually don't always cover precious metals. But what's interesting, we know we have Russ on the channel. You guys should definitely check out his Friday videos. He's been doing some phenomenal stuff. He just did a video kind of talking about the Fed uh, kind of being out of you know out of control when it comes to monetary policy. Devin has some really interesting details there. I won't spoil it for you guys if you want to go check it out. But the key thing I, I want to talk about here overall, and so I, I chat a lot with Russ, and I, I'm also listening to a lot of different sources, but he's really brought precious metals back in the picture for me because precious metals, for the most part, for the last decade, just really underperformed, were not very exciting. But what's going on here in precious metals now, whether you're talking about gold or silver, is really interesting. You know, we, we had a great trend breakout here. Gold broke to new highs here, uh, really getting up into the $2,100 range. It's just barely, it's not even coming down and touching the 21 day. So huge trend strength here for a relatively, you know, kind of conservative asset. And we had this big you know, kind of pullback here, this big amount of this tall wick here. Market prices were expanding, huge pullback on the day. And for a lot of traders, including myself, I looked at that and I thought, yeah, that looks like, you know, we're at least due for 21 day. Let's see how it holds out there. Uh, you know, might be the kind of end for the, for the near term. But then the next day, it gets bought right back up and it's holding. Now, we're sure, we're not where we were back here on April 12th at the, the absolute peak of the day. My point here is that this is really like concerning stuff. Like, I, I mean, overall, like if you're, uh, you know, going long gold, this is like great positive signs in price. But what this tells me is that global markets are are really turning towards you know previously beaten down hedging and protective assets that weren't the the darling plays during an era of easy money. I think this is a big misconception here 
that people see gold as a, a you know kind of a money debasement hedge. I think Bitcoin is a money debasement hedge. It is where excess money goes to live. Uh, whereas in this case, investors turn to gold when uh, essentially they're expecting that you know we are entering a risk off period. We are entering a period of time where there is currency weakness. Uh, you know that essentially people are looking for hedging into something that is not tied to any particular government um, or any type of currency or economy. And we see the same here with silver. Uh, again, Russ has been really kind of ahead of the curve on this. He built some really solid positions on silver uh, past, um, and really this has been a high conviction trade of his for the past couple of months. He's been really watching this on his radar. And again, uh, silver here, chopping around a little bit right now, like at the highs here after that that daily candle that is gonna be you know difficult for these markets to come through. But so far, they're holding up nicely here. I mean, we're not even seeing a pullback to the 21 day. And even if that happens, depending on how price reacts there, it could bounce off just like it did back here in March. So this is all just telling signs here that something's going on. And when you start to compare, I think this is an important thing to keep in mind here. When you start to compare the performance of silver, you divide silver by the S&P 500, you start to see we've made an explosive move here. And we are knocking on the door of the 200 week here to potentially make a much more substantial move here. Right? We could very well be due for that broader upswing like we saw here from 2000 to 2011, where silver outperformed the S&P 500 during that window time by 1100%. Huge amounts of price gains versus there. Gold as well, similar scenario here. Watching on the charts, look at this long-term descending wedge. I think many would say that we're getting very close to be able to say we've had a breakout. I think the safe bet here would be to wait for a breakout above that 100 EMA. And when you get that, I mean, guys, we've seen this. This can make substantial moves against equities. Even if you're not going from the absolute lows, if you're like waiting for the, the 100 month to become support, 209 and near 300% or in this case, a 4x move against the S&P 500. So I, I bring all this to you guys here today, not to make you panic. I think there are opportunities out there. We could have some great entry points on some of the altcoins. We're talking plays like Render here and, and Stacks, you know, playing off of the D-Pin or Bitcoin infrastructure narrative. We could very well see that these assets, and maybe Bitcoin does start to, you know, decouple from global assets and becomes more of this risk off asset and this hedging asset for people to, to put capital elsewhere that has, still has that kind of potential to be uh, on par with gold's market cap. I don't know. Uh, the key thing I would say here is that I'm looking for much better entries here. When I'm seeing this kind of chop and uninterest at the 100 day moving average, like there was back here, just compare the price action. The last time we visited this back in January, it's completely inconsistent here. We, we, we just tapped off the 100 day every single time and buyers would drive prices higher. Now, there's a lot of volatility and uncertainty. The order books are revealing themselves to be relatively thin. I think in this case, as, as Russ has mentioned here, market makers overall are, are setting markets back into play. Uh, essentially, they're, they're, uh, they're at a point here where they're, they're, not, they're not making as much money and stuff when price gets to these kind of euphoric levels. So essentially, markets are starting to correct here. And we're starting to see that people are not willing to pay the same kind of premium on assets, or in this case, a much higher premium than back a couple months ago. Um, you know, they're not as willing to continue driving the trend higher. So I think that we've got to test at a minimum this 200 week pocket. That's where you could maybe start to accumulate some. Uh, it's testing some of those prior uh, high resistance points back in December. But also I wouldn't be surprised if we get a deviation and you come down to a big even level like five bucks. So keep that in mind when it comes to render. Also, I'd say stacks as well here. You know, if we extend it here, made an 820% move off of the low back here in August. I think there's a good chance you come down here again below the 200 day. Not too crazy. Not saying that the overall trend is done for, but you can get altcoins at these type of corrections, guys. It happens before. I want to signify here that we had from uh, kind of the period of March here, 2023, and Bitcoin started to stall in August, a 70% correction for stacks. We take a look back at Render as well. We saw a 54% correction here. Right? Not to mention the prior correction here in February, right? 57%. So people, there, there will always be some people 
you know, it's unfortunate because people get tribal about their positions. And I get that. It's not fun seeing the markets go down. I know some people are going to just rub off what I say and say I'm being too bearish. Or I'm, I'm, I'm setting expectations the prices are going too low. At the end of the day, guys, I, my focus is preserving and protecting my capital. I made some great money here in 2024. Made up a lot for the past year where I didn't do too much in crypto markets or equities for that matter. And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to risk the the gains that I made. I made phenomenal returns. I bet some of you who even bought way ahead of time. This is a question that you should be asking. You know, people like myself were kind of on the sidelines of 2023, right? I'm already in, in this case where I want to preserve and protect what I made. Uh, I know that I'm coming a bit later into the move. And while there may be more upside in the future, which I don't doubt, I think for those who have made life-changing returns buying when no one else wanted to back in those capitulal lows in 2022 or throughout the greater part of 2023 if you're up multiples on your crypto investments you, you got to be able to ask yourself that ras rational question there's not no one on youtube is going to tell you this uh, I, it's just because they don't have an incentive to they want you to keep getting drummed up and excited especially if the narrative that they're preaching is constantly bullish um and that they're overexposed themselves the important thing you've got to ask, and I say this as a friend, is whether or not the trend is done. Whether or not, whether you're talking about the short term, whether you're talking about the long term, whether or not you're holding on to backs. And if you're down a little bit in your positions, stomach make a loss. It's okay. You'll come back, right? But outside of those, well, if you're someone who's still up multiples and you're starting to see those gains fade, just realize that they can continue going down and down and down and never come back to the point they were at before. Don't get caught in the psychological trap that is just guaranteed to go up. So I remember I'm going to out here today, guys. I hope you all enjoyed the core part of this video. If you did, consider dropping a like. But I want to spend some time to talk about one really key project because if you guys are looking to buy a lot of these altcoins uh, that we're watching, you know, even things that are beyond ERC-20 tokens, I think you guys are really going to love the sponsor we're talking about today, which is RocketX Exchange. A really phenomenal DeFi protocol. So I want to dive into the review here. It's one of the most exciting ones I've seen that really addresses the need for a multi-chain future. So let's go ahead and kick off the review. Alrighty, everyone. So in today's sponsored review, I want to spend some time to talk about one of the most genuinely exciting DeFi protocols I've come across in the last year or two, and I think is solving for one of the biggest user experience issues and friction points in the ever-evolving landscape of crypto. Today, we're talking about none other than RocketX Exchange, which is aiming to build the ultimate decentralized exchange platform for a multi-chain world. Before we can truly understand why this is really important and what RocketX is doing, we need to understand how the crypto landscape has evolved over the last couple of years. Back when I was really getting started in crypto my first few years, back in 2017 to 2019, in that period of time, the only real network where activity was really happening, where you had alternative cryptocurrency tokens and liquidity, was pretty much on the Ethereum network. There were some alternative networks, but it was really the central hub. But in 2020 and beyond, we started to enter into what many people call a multi-chain future, where we had a variety of alternative L2 networks that were also EVM compatible to the Ethereum network, like Polygon, Arbitrum, Binance Smart Chain, you know, you name it. There's so many optimism, and there's still more and more L2s coming out every single day, offloading a lot of that traffic from the main network. But beyond that, there are also alternative L1 ecosystems like Solana or Aptos that work in entirely different language frameworks from the same framework that was utilized on Ethereum. So this led us in a situation where not only users and liquidity were siloed on different networks, but beyond that as well, it was very difficult and you had to use unvetted risky bridges to move liquidity from one chain to another or utilize centralized exchanges to move liquidity over and then proceed to have to go through and swap into the other asset you may be looking to trade into. It was so many steps, so much cost and so much risk involved. Well, now with RocketX, that is no longer a problem. RocketX is not a white paper or an idea. It is a real functioning multi-chain DEX that allows you to not just do the simple swaps and simple bridging transactions if you so choose, but allows you to do multi-chain swaps or cross-chain swaps. So this is really exciting stuff. And I want to go ahead and kind of demo that today, or at least just kind of showcase what is possible here with RocketX. The application is live today. You guys can use it. You can test out anything we demonstrate here in today's video. So I think that, again, this really shows a testament here that the team's been working on this for the past couple of years, and they built something that's very clearly needed ever more in the crypto space now than ever. 
So I want to signify one key thing here. And this is basically the, the basic thing to understand, which is that even if you're not wanting to do cross-chain swaps, it's important to understand that RocketX can help you do all the basics. If you want to have a decentralized exchange that gives you the best rates to swap from one asset to another on the same network, like you would with Uniswap or SushiSwap or with a DEX aggregator like uh, OneInch, for example, you can do that with RocketX. It is going to give you the best rate. And the reason why is because it's sourcing from all major sources from unique decentralized exchange pools as well as aggregators like OneEdge. So it's giving you the best rate here from swapping to one asset to another. In this case, I've selected I want to swap one ETH and USDC. I want to kind of cash out here. And that's the rate I'm going to get right here. So it's pretty much, if you look at the USDC amount here, right, we're basically off by like a dollar here. So this is really great deep liquidity here where I'm able to swap from one asset to another with very little slippage. But beyond that as well, I can also bridge liquidity from another network. So let's say, for example, I don't want to swap out of Ethereum, but instead I want to move Ethereum over to, for example, the base network. So in this case, I can select Ethereum here. And it's going to go ahead and give me the best possible rate how I can switch Ethereum from one network to another. And you can see here again, I'm basically getting almost nearly the same amount here. It's a fractional cost here. So it's getting me deep liquidity here. It's analyzing the best available pools here. And it taps into the RocketX pool here, which is going to allow for us to save over $32 on bridging liquidity. How cool is that? So this is really good stuff here. It's a huge cost saver for one, even for just doing those basic things. But here's the really interesting catch. What if I want to go ahead and I want to swap from one asset to another and from one network to another, right? So I want to, for example, let's choose our network here. Let's say that I want to uh, actually swap into stacks, right? Now this is like, this is just really showing the power here because I essentially want to swap from Ethereum to stacks in a decentralized way. I'm not going through a centralized exchange. I want to be able to bridge my existing Ethereum onto the Stacks network and swap into the Stacks native currency, STX. This is one that we talk about a lot on the channel. And that I did not even know was possible, but with RocketX, it is. I can swap, and I'm gonna save about five bucks here versus doing this manually or through other sources. So I'm able to swap from ETH on the Ethereum network to Stacks on the Stacks blockchain in a single transaction. I'm bridging liquidity and swapping at the same time. For me, that, that, that's really exciting. This is just such a huge user experience issue in the crypto sector. It's been for such a long time. And to see something like this, I think it definitely allows for the concept, which I'll be honest, I used to be skeptical of this idea of like a multi-chain future, right? I used to be really skeptical of this, but now with something like RocketX, this is actually at least reasonable now. And now it can allow you to tap into opportunities much quicker, but do so in a decentralized fashion and do it in much less transactions than trying to go through routing through a centralized exchange, having the wait time for your funds to show up and then swapping it out. You can do this and it can seamlessly transact from one wallet to another. So if you're, for example, uh, swapping to the Solana network, for example, we want to bridge into, uh, let's say, for example, I, I want to go into USDC. So I'm swapping from Ethereum to USDC and I'm going from the Ethereum network to Solana. Uh, in this case, I can bridge liquidity from my MetaMask over to my Phantom Wallet seamlessly, all in one transaction. Again, really, really cool stuff here. And we're saving lots of money doing this using the RocketX pool at its core. Now, in order to understand, again, to kind of put this in perspective more, I'm, I'm very much numbers oriented and I'm always, at the end of the day, I'm very skeptical uh, with DeFi. I'm, I'm one of those kind of original DeFi OGs in 2019 who is a big believer in trust but verify. You know, I essentially want to make sure that these things have a track record, have a history. And the really cool thing is that I know RocketX as a team has been working on this for a long time. So they believe in this vision. They understand the need for it. But beyond that, there is daily metrics here. They're showcasing that the protocol is almost near its peak adoption here. Uh, it set an all-time high for trades of 2,400 in a day. We're sitting here at 2,377 right now. If we look at the uh, kind of cumulative number here, we can see that overall the protocol has seen a lot of growth over time doing hundreds of thousands of swaps with over 524 million dollars in volume 4 million over the last 24 hours and the big thing here that i think is really great about rocketx is that essentially speaking 
it's kind of in a league of its own here. There isn't any protocol out there I know that has this degree of flexibility in a cross-chain transaction. And I think that that's a very big kind of moat here that the platform has. Being early to this, they've been building this for the past couple of years. It's not easy to build the architecture around something like this. And to have this kind of amount of users utilizing a DeFi protocol, tens of thousands, is really great adoption considering its valuation and where it sits as a project right now. There's a couple key things that I also wanted to echo here that I, I don't think I'll probably get the coverage that it deserves, but they also have a RocketX API. And this to me is actually probably just as big of a deal as the front end itself, which already works really smooth. It's very clean to get those quotes and rates on different networks. But the reason why I think the RocketX API is big is from a biz dev perspective, as someone who used to own a cryptocurrency wallet or was the leader of a, a founding a cryptocurrency DeFi wallet back in 2020 and 2021, I know how important it is to get the best rates and to be able to connect to those networks that are going to be much more cost effective for users. So being able to have something like RocketX that's already built this technology and being able to integrate it in my own front end, like a wallet or a dApp or decentralized exchange and web browser, that's huge. This is going to allow for RocketX to scale. And to talk about why this is important here, right? We need to understand how the actual platform's broadening adoption benefits the RVF token, the native utility token of the RocketX exchange. So I wanna spend some time to talk about that here because in the growing adoption of the platform, there are a lot of benefits to the RVF token and ideally it's long-term success. The first thing here is that similar to a lot of utility tokens on exchanges, there is trading discounts where people can pay practically no fees or lower fees by staking the RVF token in their wallet. So essentially, if you're holding the RVF token, you're able to get a variety of discounts depending on the larger portion of RVF you have. And if you're someone who's actively day trading a lot and trading in meme coins and a whole range of different ecosystems and all the different opportunities that are coming out right now that it's so difficult to keep up with, with all that's going on in crypto, that already is a really great value proposition. But beyond that as well, the platform itself has multiple revenue streams that all feed back into an RVF buyback program. Not only, as I mentioned earlier, can you do swaps as well as being able to do cross-chain bridging, but also cross-chain swaps is kind of the bread and butter here. Having the best of both worlds in a single transaction. This is really what makes RocketX Exchange stand out. But they also have RocketX listing fees, they have enterprise widgets, and also their partner APIs, as we discussed earlier. I think that all of these things, it's also a kind of SaaS model, in this case, of having an API for other platforms in the crypto industry, is not only going to, again, build up its moat over time as the source that people are trading from, but this is going to allow for it to generate much more revenue long term than just you know, hoping and relying that people come to the front end of RocketX, which I think is already bringing a lot of great traffic right now. But beyond that as well, they also have daily token burns. So for example, they have a buy and sell tax essentially for DEX trading, and about 70% of this is gonna go back towards buyback program for the RBF token. So again, as you go down the list here, this is not the only thing. They're also bridging transactions between ETH and BSC networks. Uh, we're also, in this case, RBF. There's a fee applied. Those tokens get burned. There's a whole range of different things here that you can dive into. But generally speaking, for me at the core, that buy and sell tax of the revenue generated from swaps or utilization of the platform, benefiting the RVF token and limiting the supply, that for me is one of the biggest points here. Not to mention, obviously, the adoption of the API and other enterprise solutions that the team's built. This, over the long term, could really leave RVF doing quite well. And over the last really like year or so, obviously RVF has done really well here as the market has picked up. And I think what's really nice is it's cooled down here a little bit here and sitting at like a $40 million market cap building this. I say this solely from myself, guys, not because they're sponsored or anything. I think that generally speaking, this is like really low personally. And I usually don't like to talk about price when it comes to having sponsors on the channel. I say that here because like there's a real token burn mechanism. There's so many governance tokens around different types of DEXs or aggregators in the crypto space that don't really hold much utility to the core platform. And for me, RocketX in this case really satisfies the ability to know that with the platforms for their adoption, there is going to be general benefit to the token. So I like that. You know, long term, I think that that's really important. 
Probably the most important thing above all though, and this is like for me the ultimate filter about whether or not I'd be talking about RocketX here on the channel, guys, is security, right? I'm someone who's been in DeFi since back in 2019. I take security, you know, not with a grain of salt, but as my central focus with any protocol. You can have all the great features and utilities, you can have the greatest bridges or best rates in the market, but do you actually have a secure framework? And the really great thing about this is that RocketX has been properly audited. And they've been audited by two agencies that I really like, especially Zocchio, who I've worked with in the past as well. We use, utilize Zocchio as well in a previous audit for my company back in the past. I know that they're a good quality auditing agency. There's some out there that are kind of subpar, okay. Zocchio is top grade, so for me, I was really happy to see that. And for me, it gave me the confidence that overall RocketX is a serious project here that is not messing around. So if you wanna dive into some of the kind of probably frequent questions, you might have some as well that are buzzing through your head before you really start utilizing it. You guys can definitely check out the security documentation. But the important thing I, I wanna kind of signify here to kind of explain how RocketX works to an extent. RocketX is not some exchange or DEX product where you're staking liquidity there. There's only a fractional window of time where you may be giving exposure up to your funds, where if they're tapping into centralized exchange liquidity in order to give the best rate, where you have to wait for your funds to arrive to your wallet. Otherwise, in this case, everything is smart contract executed as you would normally do through a decentralized exchange or DeFi protocol. So it's all standard by the books, and you're not having to really put your trust in the Rock and X team here. It functions as intended. But again, feel free to dive into the documentation additional resources and some of the additional things maybe like Fiona ramps etc now i want to go ahead and talk about the roadmap here because what's really great is that in q1 they've delivered on all the major items here they've got the token burn mechanism starting to play in which is a huge deal here for benefiting the token but beyond that as well they have a whole range of networks they tapped into and obviously as well blockchain integrations but now they're moving on towards the next wave of steps so in this case being able to do walletless swaps in this case from your browser, uh, you know, being able to do this without needing to interact with mobile wallets, this is really exciting. And I think that there's a whole range of other things like limit order functionality, which are going to be really big to have that traditional trading experience. We've seen on Solana as well that DCA and limit order functionality has been really big on a lot of the AMMs, and that's finally starting to come to fruition. But they're going to be every single quarter adding in new blockchains. So this will essentially be, I think, in many ways the biggest number one source to be able to easily bridge liquidity into the best new emerging networks where the new thriving opportunities are, whether it's in trends like meme coins or deep pan or decentralized physical infrastructure networks or Bitcoin infrastructure, you name it, we'll be able to plug into a whole range of networks and of course, obviously a mobile app launch in the future. So it seems like in this case that they're now potentially playing on you know, being this kind of DEX aggregator across multiple chains, but also becoming maybe the central hub where you do all your activities. It might even go beyond swaps and serve as almost like a mobile wallet. I don't know about that, but at the end of the day, I think the roadmap looks really exciting. And I think that this is going to allow for RocketX to become a serious player in the space. And above all, if you guys are looking for an additional way to earn, or if you guys want to support my channel here, I'll leave a link down below in the description where you guys can utilize uh, the referral program here and earn up to 50% commission by referring people to RocketX Exchange. This is really great. This is on par with really like what Binance and some of the exchanges used to offer back in the day where you get 50% of the commissions from people who are, who are trading through your referral link and you get it paid out on a monthly basis in USDT. So this is really exciting stuff here. Not to mention obviously the discounts that come with using the RBF token for your trading if you're using it for yourself. So no matter if you're really looking to share this with friends who need a solid DEX or you yourself need this platform to bridge liquidity and swap, I think in this case, RocketX is the premier platform to do it, guys. I have yet to see a platform of this kind of caliber that fixes this core UX issue. And I want to give my hats off to the team for building this. I think this is really exciting stuff. And I'd love to hear what you guys have as an experience utilizing the platform. If you've already used it, leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you're positive or negative, let me know your genuine thoughts on it. Um, and outside of that as well, if you have any questions as well about RocketX, I fit, that you can feel free to leave them down below. Uh, I'll try to get them answered, or at a minimum, you guys can reach out in the docs section of the FAQ. But definitely give it a shot. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on it. If you enjoyed this review, consider dropping a like. It's a great way to support the channel. But until the next one, everyone, I'll see you guys in the next video. Stay safe, trade smart. I'll see you guys.